Could your organization survive a challenge, a challenge like leadership change, maybe another recession or COVID? You are watching Influence Media, PSI TV, the Netflix of biz brands. Stresses happen to businesses all the time and many fail while some thrive. COVID challenges businesses to solve big problems and how to transition successfully to remote work, how to effectively manage workers in a remote setting and how to survive when your client base has their income dried out. Regardless of the challenge, leaders have to find a way to fight for solutions, even when the natural human tendency is to freeze or flight or just completely give up. Adam Mack is my guest today. She has dedicated more than two decades to problem solving. She's the founder and managing director of Luminescence Consulting Group, a boutique agency specializing in leadership empowerment and providing solutions for business challenges. She brings her expertise as a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, certified agile coach and agile worker, uh, agile workshop facilitator. She shares some of that expertise in her book, Escaping the Hamster Wheel, a disruptive approach to solutioning complex business problems. This book also has a companion workbook. Welcome, Ida. Hi, Trudy. Thank you. And thank you for that amazing introduction. You mentioned in your book a 70% failure rate for change initiatives. Yes. Now, change is, a cha it change is challenging for the average person let alone an organization with multiple staff. What is the yes. solution to successful organizational change? And what does that have to do with escaping the hamster wheel? So I think, and that's a loaded question because when you ask what's the solution, I, I don't want to come out and say, you know, we have experts who will come out and say, oh, this is a one-stop shop. You get all the solutions here. I don't believe there is a simple solution to how we manage I think what we need to start doing is looking at change and, and again, the level of complexity, acknowledging how complex change is. So when we, we look at organizations in particular, and I talk about this in my book often with a couple examples, you have organizations who want to approach change and they haven't really fully understand, understood the wide impact that that change could have on their organization. Change can occur at different levels in the organization. It can occur at the operational level. It can occur at the individual level. And then you have change that affects the, the project level as well. So when I say that 70% of initiatives fail, um, change initiatives fail, we have to think in concept, concept of what is a change initiative and why aren't we looking at that in more detail to fully understand why they are failing because with that comes other things you have uh, layoffs you have employee apathy you have companies who are closing their doors because they are constantly going through these different initiatives and not fully executing them and not fully understanding what the true problem is and what ends up happening is they fail and what is interesting within that in my book i talk about even within the 70% of the change initiatives, that's a guess. I could only find two studies where they actually looked at the true numbers. This was a number that was a guesstimate from um, prior, prior to, I would say the 2000. And we've been using these numbers and rattling these numbers off. And we don't even know the true origin of these numbers. Okay. So... <laughs> Ida, you have a signature approach and you refer yeah. to it in your book as a disruptive approach to solutioning mm -hmm. complex business problems. Uh, now, solutioning seems to also be a word that is, if you haven't coined it, it's very um, attached to you. Let's put it that way. Yeah. We want <laughs> the listener to grab your book. However, yeah. uh, if you would... Tell us, what would it look like to work with you um, when an organization invites you in uh, to consult using your solutioning disruptive approach? So I, and 
to address a couple of things. So the first thing about solutioning, it's something I realized over the years. And it, just as a black belt, I go in and I work with different organizations to fully understand what is the root cause of what's occurring in their organization. And it can be from operations to systems, could literally be almost anything in terms of how do you get the product out the door and meet customer needs. And the one thing I notice is that we have a mindset of solve. You know, and once you solve, it kind of implies there's a finality to it. Oh, she's going to come in. She's going to fix our problems. Then they go away and we move on with our day. When in fact, in business, it, there's constant change. We, we just discussed things are constantly changing. So you don't necessarily solve anything because you can't unless you're going to just wipe everything out and start over. Everything that you put attach some type of solution to is going to keep going. And as the economy changes, as the business change, as your culture change, as all these different variables that play into your environment change, you're going to have to find new solutions. So it's about being that verb, being active. How do I continue to solution the constant evolving changes that are occurring in my organization? When you come in with a solve mindset, you look up and you you either have, and this is where disruptive problem solutioning comes in, you either have a simple problem that because you believe you've solved it, then you're done. You're not even paying attention to it anymore. Or you have a solution mindset, which is more of a disruptive mindset of I'm going to constantly be challenging, constantly be questioning how can I solution this? I know that today, what today's market looks like, what our operations look like today, and next quarter, it may look completely different. So how am I going to stay on top of those problems to continue to solution them? And the way I propose we do that is through something called the TAP approach. And this ties back to where you asked me, Trudy, about leadership and uh, leaders. I believe that each individual leader has a responsibility. They need to have that integrity and an ethical responsibility to approach, um, to approach each of their roles as a solutioning mindset. And when I say leader, I'm not just talking about people who hold the role of a title of a director or a VP. If you are an adult, you walk into a company and you're employed, or you own a company and you know you employ people, you make decisions that have impact on others, whether it's the people within your organization or your customer. So you are in effect a leader. So when I say leaders, that's what I'm talking about. So within that, with the TAP approach, I say that it took me a while to come up with this, but as an individual leader, if I go into my position and, and just my role as a leader with transforming my mindset and being open to change, being open that things aren't going to be the way they are, they were yesterday, they may not be. I need to be open to that. So I need to transform my mindset. Then I also need to align my cultural values. So I have a responsibility to take my cultural values and align them with the company's cultural values. As well as if I am a leader who have who has employees, I need to ensure that my employees are walking in or my colleagues even are walking in and we are all working towards the same common goal and vision, which are all tied to cultural values. If my cultural values differ from yours, and imagine this is why we have conflicts in organizations, and I come in and I say, I want things this way because I value things this way, but the organization's values don't line up with that. And if it's a person with position of power, what do you do? This is why we have the conflicts and companies can't really affect change and move forward because we have all these convicting values. If we all walk in with the same not necessarily the same, but similar mindset, the same vision, the same goal, and we lead with integrity, we are going to address things in a way that we ensure that it's aligned with the company's cultural values and we're taking the company in the direction we need it to go in. And then I also, which we just touched on, uh, the next area is adapting a problem solution approach. And that's you come in and you're not solving problems. You don't wait for something to happen to you. You're acting and constantly assessing and looking for um, things that could potentially happen 
addressing how you solution solve pro uh, solution simple problems so they don't morph into complex problems. And if you do happen to get a complex problem, then your mindset is already prepared that you're not going into that complex problem to just solve it. You're going into that complex problem to find a solution so that you can one, keep the doors open and you can also start to make adjustments so that problem doesn't occur again. And if it does, then you're ready and prepared for it. And that leads into my next my next area, which is pivot. And under pivot, that's being able to pivot to market changes, being able to pivot to operational changes, being able to embrace change and be okay with change so that you can make that pivot. And that's what I call the TAP approach. So it's a combined, the TAP approach, it has to do with having a disruptive problem solutioning mindset, but also really just focusing in on as a leader, I need to lead with integrity. I need to make sure my core values line up with the organizational's core values because I've made a commitment to this organization and to the people in the organization. And I also need to have a problem solutioning mindset so that when I approach things, I am constantly and actively looking for solutions and not just to solve so I can go on and tackle the next you know, big thing that pops up at some point. So instead of squashing fires you just make sure they don't really come up at all yes people generally understand the hamster wheel concept of moving and being busy without progress mm -hmm. your book talks about this hamster wheel you should you suggest escaping the hamster wheel mm -hmm. And you offer actually a lot of case studies in your book. One of the things I really loved about your book is the plethora of case studies to justify and to reinforce your points. Would you share on one of these case studies that explains cultural transformation? So what's interesting to me, I'm going to give you an example that I hindsight is 2020, I should have put in my book. And it was one of the most sex successful cultural transformations I've done in my career. I was working in social services and I had was asked to come in and assist with adjusting a, a, an organization. It was a school with probation youth. And if you can imagine, you have violence. You have, uh, when I tell you they had riots, they had the SWAT team flying over the building. It was really... A, a, a dangerous situation. Um, I worked with the staff and this is an idea of what it would look like to work with me. I don't just come in and say, okay, what's your problem? I need to understand what's really going on. So I came in, I did a clear assessment. I interviewed the staff. I, and I say interview, it's not formal. I had conversations with them, had lunch with them, um, you know, met with the director, got a feel of that, asked if I could meet with the clients, was able to meet with the clients. And what I came up with is that the staff weren't empowered. So they had a lot of rules, but the staff weren't committed to the rules because it was, you don't understand our job and how dangerous our job is. They were in survival mode. So the first thing I did was said, okay, let's take a break. And thank goodness the director was open to it. I said, let's have the staff write the rule book. And I spent six months with the staff, literally six months creating a policy and procedure book and put in place ways to actually keep it up to date, you know, like some checks to make it sustainable. And they went from having police cars, <laughs> SWAT teams flying over to zero is incidents, zero, no fights, no nothing. And the culture around that was there was a lack of connection to the organization's core values, and there was a lack of empowerment of the staff. And that was one of my most impactful ways that I've ever um, came in and adjusted the culture because it's a lot of it's tied to behavior and we were able to shape that behavior and then staff were more involved and what we ended up with was a shockingly very quiet <laughs> very quiet in, in a good way school and well, the staff Ida, were more happy. So Ida, you've done something in your book that I truly wish more of my guest authors would have done. You offer resources, freed, free and paid resources that the reader can actually take action after reading the book. One of your free resources that I believe will be very useful in the coming economy is the Escape the Hamster Wheel Employee Coaching. So uh, what they can expect is someone to help them. There will be some group support as well. Um, 
but it is it's the key of starting to work on yourself so that as you progress through your professional journey, you can be a better employee, you can be a better leader. And, and that's what my coaching is about. It is a safe space. Wow, there you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, Ida Mack, escaping the hamster wheel, a disruptive approach to solutioning complex business problems. I read the book. She's on point with leadership. And you can connect with Ida at her website, www.idapmac.com. And I will put that in the credits so you don't make mistakes with the spelling. Ida, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here.